Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a This Year in Perfume and we are officially one decade in the past, only 10 years previous. We're going to catch up. We're going to catch up in 2024, I'll tell you that. Um, and so this is an exciting year. There are a ton of fragrances and I'll tell you what, uh, as my collection has grown, doing these videos has become more and more of an absolute pain in the ass because there are so many fragrances to discuss, especially as we get into the years where some of these new niche houses propped up and they released a bunch of fragrances at once. This is a long list. We've got something like um, 36 fragrances ranked here, uh, either full bottles in the collection or samples, which I promised if I have reviewed them, I'll include them in the ranking. Some years I stick to that, some years I don't. This year I, I did. Um, and so we've got a ton of honorary mentions, a ton of fragrances to discuss from the year 2014. But first, let's put ourselves back in that frame of mind from the year 2014. And here's some of the news stories that were going on a decade ago. Uh, crazy to think it was 10 years ago. It really makes you feel old, um, especially if you're in your late 30s like me. Uh, 2014 does not seem like 10 years ago. So the Ebola pandemic was apparently a global health crisis in, in 2014 in places like... Uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, places like that. Um, there was that disaster on the Malaysian Airlines uh, flight. Um, oh, what was the flight called? I forget the flight number, but apparently uh, it was uh, 239 people on board that ended up dying. It was a, a plane uh, disaster, basically, made national headlines. And the fighting in the Ukraine and the Crimea really got kick-started in 2014. So this, is, this is a little bit crazy because it's almost like reading headlines from 2024. Fighting in Ukraine and Crimea uh, got its roots sort of uh, back in 2014. And, and then also the, it says, deadly Israel-Hamas conflict. I mean, it, it's literally like listening to the news today, but from 10 years ago. And um, the Sochi Olympics took place. I, I remember watching some of that. Um, Robin Williams and Joan Rivers both died in 2014, and, um, so that kind of gets us, I guess, back in the frame of mind. Uh, a robot makes its first ever comet landing. So, how's that? Back in 2014. Uh, so, top 10 movies in 2014, according to just Googling, what, what were the top 10 movies in 2014? If there are other movies or songs we're going to discuss, leave in the comments, but Guardians of the Galaxy, Whiplash, The Grand Budapest Hotel, Gone Girl, I remember watching that. Bitch was crazy. Uh, Birdman, Edge of Tomorrow, Interstellar, Boyhood, Selma, uh, and then things like the Lego movie, Nightcrawler. I, I remember seeing Nightcrawler in theater, I believe. Uh, Godzilla, Jump Street, uh, Maleficent, Fury. I remember seeing Fury in theaters. That definitely takes me back to the time period because I remember watching Fury. Um, what else? Uh, Jump Street, Under the Skin. Okay, so that gets us back in, in 2014 movie shape. And then finally, top 10 songs released in 2014, just according to what are the top 10 songs of 2014. Thinking Out Loud by Ed Sheeran, Selena Gomez, The Heart Wants What It Wants, Maroon 5 Animals, Rixton, Me and My Broken Heart, Jesse J, Masterpiece, Oi, Ali Murs, Up, featuring Demi Lovato, Sam Smith, Stay With Me, and Pharrell Williams, Happy. Um, so, yes, if I try to click on more, it says you do not have access. So, if there's any favorite songs from 2014... Uh, leave it in the comments. So let's get started. This is going to be a long video. Um, so first thing we have to do scent of the day. It's just a must. So scent of the day, um, <laughs> scent of the day. This is going to be a hell of a video. Well, problem is I don't know what to say other than this is not a serious fragrance. I'll tell you that right now. This, this is not a serious fragrance and I don't think it's a serious brand. So I'm wearing a Amafi fragrance. If you watched my unboxing from a couple videos ago, a friend in the community reached out and said, Hey Ramsey, uh, I've done pretty well for myself. I bought a $4,300 fragrance because I saw an advertisement for it. And I'm like, I got it. And I was like, what the hell is this basically? No one talks about this brand. Uh, I want you to do your honest review on it. And he sent me, so you get two bottles when you buy for $4,300, you should get like 200 bottles, but, um, you get two bottles. One is the 75 bill with the pure decked out. The bottle looks like it's crystal and all this stuff. And it comes in like a Roja Dove like box and they give you a 50 mil travel atomizer. So he sent me like the 50 mil travel bottle, if you will. The damn thing leaks. No matter how much I clean it, it, it leaks right here, which is completely unacceptable. The cap is just cheap as fuck. Um, I don't know how else to say it other than this is not a serious fragrance. I mean, if this was 50 or 100 bucks, okay, it's not bad. It's created by Nathalie Feisthauer. She's a serious perfumer. 
uh, but she's created a ton of stuff that sell for 50 or 100 bucks that I enjoy. Why is this 4300? These brands are, are literally taking the piss. Uh, so I wore a $4,300 fragrance to work today, and uh, I just kind of felt like, meh. And especially since it's Elemi Resin, Oud, and Vetiver are the three notes. They call it a very masculine uh, release. And I, um, the crazy part is, I don't think it's a terrible fragrance. Uh, it's very synthetic smelling to my nose. The oud is very fresh. It's not um, sort of animalic stinky oud or anything like that. Very easily, you know what this feels like? Uh, it feels like if Creed made a fragrance. If Creed made a fragrance of this type, uh, that's this is how I would expect it to smell. Very wearable, but $4,300? Um, they must be out of their damn minds in my opinion. So I'll do a full review of this. Unfortunately, I don't know what else I'm going to say in the full review other than what I just said, but uh, needless to say, I think it will be an interesting review. Amafi uh, Intrigant. Intrigant is the name of the fragrance. Uh, I have no clue when this came out, but this brand is, they're out of their damn minds. And the other fragrances that are one step up, um, are one step up, they uh, are even more expensive. They're like six or seven thousand. So, I mean, I'd love to do videos on some of that stuff just for the Fragcom, for this exact situation. Um, and especially, I think, if you've smelled any of the proper artisanal houses, the Aris Ladores, Bortnikovs, Ensars, if you're spending 4300 expecting to get something of that type of quality, you will be very, very let down, in my opinion. So, uh, But Amafi Intrigant is my scent of the day. Uh, hilarious stuff. Okay, so... Uh, first of all, we are going to do some decants, which or bottles that will be coming to me at some point, uh, because I do have some bottles that a friend's sending me for free, uh, and so that is coming by way of Rich Mitch, uh, and so he actually did a video on Seal to Gum today about it, about his early impression on it, and I did a video on Seal to Gum a couple days ago, uh, my, my full review, I did like a ramble, like a, ram like a Ramsey rambling on Seal to Gum as well, a long time ago, off when I had a decant. Now that I have a full bottle, I did a um, a um, full review, if you will. And so just some honorary mentions, if you will, where I could do reviews off of samples, or you'll probably see some, or bottles that are coming. Amouage Journey Woman, which I've done like a live stream talking about some of the women's Amouage, and Sunshine Woman. Opus 8, which is coming up on our Opus line. We've made it all the way. The next one, we've been going in order. So we started at one, um, uh -huh. so we started at one, and we went all the way through Opus 6. So seven is next, and then we'll get to Opus 8, which I have a decant of, thanks to my good, uh, my Amouage Sugar Mama Alley. Thank you very much for all the beautiful Amouage that you've sent me, Alley, keeping my nose current on Amouage. Um, so I have uh, Opus 8 is from 2014. Bulgari's Aqua Amara, which I have a decant of, thanks to Anuj. Creed's Vetiver Geranium, which I have a decant of thanks to David, who sent me the cigars. Very kind gentleman. Um, and Dior's Dior Ohm O, which is actually probably my favorite version of the summery or sport flanker versions of Dior. Um, oh my God, now that I'm looking at this, I just realized I forgot one bottle. Oh well, you, we're, we're going to have to just keep going. I'm not doing all this again. There is a bottle missing, and as soon as I said Dior, it hit me which one it was. So I did not grab it, but you guys have seen it before, so it's not a big deal. Um, but um, Dior Homme O, I have a sample of, so I'll do a video on that one day. That's a discontinued, hard-to-find, like, summer version of Dior, which I prefer over the sport versions. Frederick Mall's The Night, which is a very expensive, um, real oud fragrance by Frederick Mall. Uh, Imaginary Authors, A City on Fire, uh, and Yesterday's Haze, Joe Malone, Wood, Sage, and Sea Salt, Mask Milano's Tango, which rest in peace to um, the Mask Milano founder who passed away uh, just a couple days ago, sadly, tragically. I'll review Tango soon, kind of in his honor. Mona Di Oreo, Mur Cassati, um, which I believe is discontinued very sadly because I enjoy that one. I'd like a bottle one day. Nishani Spice Bazaar, that is one of the bottles that's making its way to me very slowly from, from Rich Mitch. Um... Nishane's Suede and Saffron, Nishane's Wulong Chan, Wulong Cha, Olfactive Studios Ombre Indigo, Orto Parisi Brutus, which I actually uh, have sp sprayed that decan, and I like Brutus, um, Queer Cuba Intense by Parfums and Nikolai, Strange Love Dead of Night, that is a good fragrance, I'd like a bottle of that one day, um, Sultan Pasha's Orum de An Angkor, which is like a um, very rare Cambodian oud, Atar that Sultan Pasha did, uh, that I think it's using an Ensar Oud. 
Towerville's Rose Flash, which I can't wait to talk about some of those tower fragrances on the channel. Terry Mugler's Amen Pure Wood, which I have a sample of, uh, thanks to Rich Mitch. Valentino Womo from 2014, the original. I think I've got a sample floating around. And Zerjoff's Pico Valle Dama, which I have smelled, and I don't think it's anything special. Um, I'd rather wear Chanel number no. 5, but um, Pico Valle Dama, I do have a sample floating around. And I think I talked a little bit about that on one of my Zerjoff live streams. So there's a bunch of samples and, and you know bottles that I don't have in the collection that... Um, you know, we will be discussing at some point on the channel, all from 2014. Those are the honorary mentions. Now we can get started on the top 36. These videos are getting huge. They're getting out of control. So number 36 is um, a Rosasi, and it's actually a um, take on Aventus, okay? And this is called Rums Al Rosasi 9325 Poor Louis. Hell of a name. Um, and the zebra has this, like... Um, Oh, I don't know how you would describe this, but it almost feels like felt or something. Um, and, and you can kind of see it blends into the barcode looking thing right here. So this is a Rosasi's take on Aventus at number 36. Um, and I actually reviewed an Aventus, a take on Aventus from 2013 uh, yesterday, last night. And it was called uh, M. Mikelaf, Martin Mikelaf is the, is the house. And uh, the fragrance is called Royal Vintage. So if you're interested in checking that out, you can go watch my review. One thing I will say about Royal Vintage is I mentioned it smells a little bit different than Aventus, especially once it gets into the heart. But once it goes back into the dry down, it's almost like the opening reminds you of Aventus. The heart steers away from it. But late into the dry down, it does bring in some of those vanillic aspects that remind me a little bit more of Aventus. So it kind of like veers away and then comes back. It's like, you know, like it's orb orbiting the Aventus sun. But um, this from memory, actually, let me get some blotters because why the hell not? Let's spray some stuff. Um, so from memory, because these videos are supposed to be a celebration anyways, but um, from memory, this fragrance is kind of a very um, citrusy floral take on Aventus. And the problem with these kind of fragrances for me, in, in my opinion, is I would, I always ask myself, why am I not just kind of wearing Aventus, if that makes sense? Because I have a lot of Aventus and I like Aventus. I enjoy Aventus. So I'm an Aventus fanboy. So why would I not, you know, it's, um, I definitely get a lot more of the green apple in the top here. It's very fruity and fresh. Um, maybe more apple-y take on Aventus rather than pineapple, but you know, Aventus has an apple note in it as well, so it doesn't make it seem too far away. There's a freesia note in here, which is no freesia in Aventus. Um, but, yeah, I mean, is it a bad fragrance? No, it's not a bad fragrance. I just, I, um, you know, it's, it's hard with these Aventus takes for me because... Aventus was such a big hit, it obviously spawned all of these copycats, and for me, I, I, I would just wear the original. Um, but uh, Rasasi's Rums Al Rasasi, 9325 Pour Louis at number 36. Number 35 is a sample. I have a video on the channel, you can check it out. It's from the House of Ajmal, and it was called Hot Kora Wood. Uh, so I've got a video, like I said, and you can go watch it if you want to learn more, but it's got this Hot Kora Lemon. No, and I remember it being a very fresh take on a wood, like a fresh woody fragrance. And I know Russian Adam told me that his favorite brand is Ajmal. And so I wanted to dive into the brand at the time and I did some reviews. The problem is with some of the um, Ajmals that are a little bit, um, not necessarily cheaper, but um, they're lower line collection, they're much more designer smelling. So for me, this one is um, kind of one that while I, in, I did enjoy it, uh, I wouldn't go out and buy a bottle or anything like that. That's what I felt from a, a lot of um, Ajmals from this line. So Hot Cora Wood at number 35. Number 34 is a Frank Bocklet fragrance, and this is called Tobacco. And Frank Bocklet's Tobacco is supposed to be a take on Tom Ford's Tobacco Vanille, go figure. Um, it's got plum and tobacco and ginger. And this is another one that is... It's not necessarily a bad fragrance, but it's a take on a better fragrance. I'd rather wear Tobacco Vanille, to be honest with you. And in fact, there's a fragrance much higher on the list from the same year, uh, perfumed by Bertrand Duchafour, that I much prefer over 
Frank Bocklet's tobacco, but I do think if you like tobacco vanilla, if you like that DNA, you will like this. This is a, it's not that it's a bad fragrance or anything like that. Um, you know, it's just in that tobacco vanilla um, genre, which that was another one that just created a whole bunch of, of, clop, of copycats of inspired by fragrances. So Frank Bocklet's tobacco at uh, number 34. Number 33 is a Guerlain. And actually, this is probably my least favorite from this Middle Eastern line. And what's crazy is these bottles here are being discontinued. They're, they're moving them into the bottles that have Herba Fresca and that kind of line. If you've seen those Guerlain bottles, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But this is called um, Santal Royale. And Santal Royale, uh, admittedly by Thierry Vasser, is one of his favorite, his favorite creations. And I'll tell you what, this is like a, um, it's just, you know what it is? Um, the name Santor Royale throws people off because you get so much jasmine and rose and florals and this big giant Middle Eastern floral peach fragrance, right? With cinnamon and this Middle Eastern style oud. And um, I do think that Thierry Vasser made some really good Middle Eastern fragrances. But the way that this one is done, I struggle with. This woody, oriental, um, musky, ambery thing with that dripping Middle Eastern style peach and big giant rose. I think this would actually smell better on a woman. I think of all of the Middle Eastern lines, um, of all of the Middle Eastern fragrances from, the, from this particular line... Um, Sanj and Ensemble Smithique and all that good stuff. I think that this is the most feminine leaning to my nose. I would rather smell this on a woman. I think this would smell amazing on a woman. Um, there are some people that say it smells better off, you know, when people smell it on you than when you are sitting there smelling it on yourself. But Santal Royale, I struggle with. I'll review it one of these days, but um, it's not my favorite. I'll tell you that. It's definitely not my favorite. It's probably, in fact, it's probably my least favorite from the line. That's why it's at number um, 33. Number 32 is a Bagwe fragrance, and many people keep asking me, Ramsey, why don't you uh, either sell the damn bottle, because you keep talking bad about it, or get to know it better and, and learn to enjoy it or whatever it is. And I struggle with this one, I'm not going to lie. Actually, I struggle with the house. And to be quite honest, I thought for the longest time that I struggled with just his perfumery. This is perfumed by Antonio Gardoni, uh, and this is called My. And I don't think he's a bad perfumer per se, but the problem with Mai, for me, is that eucalyptus note. Um, Mai is a big animalic floral fragrance, okay, by the House of Bagwe. And from smelling Antonio Gardoni's work, to be quite honest with you, my favorite that I've smelled so far is Tyrannosaurus Rex by Zoologist, which I have yet to review. I'll do a full review of, Zoolog of Zoologist Tyrannosaurus Rex one day. That is a huge fragrance, and it really fits his style. Um, this room is going to smell outrageous with Santal Royale and Mai and all this stuff. Um, but you can see, I mean, it, it stained the uh, blotter whenever I sprayed it. So Mai is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's this creamy white floral with animalics. And the animalics are, um, the animalics are basically things like civet and it smells like civet anyways i don't think there's animalics listed but it smells like there's some civet in here and very indolic jasmine lots of uh tuberose absolute tuberose can sometimes come across as smelling uh like you're smelling this um herbaceous eucalyptus like smell that's why eucalyptus is mixed with tuberose many a times uh, i think in carnal flower um there's a uh, eucalyptus tuberose combination that Dominique Ropion played with. Here, there's a big, al it's, it's basically a giant aldehydic old school floral shepra. And so I must admit, okay, I'm coming around on it very, very slowly. Very, very, very slowly. I still struggle with it. I think it's just the way Antonio Gardoni kind of works all the notes in here. The eucalyptus is very piercing and medicinal. It's maybe the most medicinal eucalyptus, maybe even more than Royal Mayfair by Creed, which I have reviewed on the channel. And I talked about how long it took me to come around to Royal Mayfair that I actually didn't like that fragrance. I almost gave it away. Um, Windsor is what it was originally called, and then it got renamed Royal Mayfair. Um, but this is another one where I think 
I bet you if I forced myself to wear this, like for days or maybe even weeks, I would begin to, I'd find enough to fall in love with it. But since I'm so off put by it, I kind of put it aside. Um, I need to force myself to wear it and get to know it better. But my is, my is a challenging one, but it's not, it's not at the very end of the list anymore. I used to just put it straight at the back of the list. Now it's moving up. It's number 32. So um, number 31 is actually a Jacques Bogart creation. And I'll tell you what, if um, you're someone who likes things like Dior's Leather Oud or those kind of uh, Oud fragrances, if you will, but you don't want to go spend Dior Privé prices, you want kind of a cheapie, you're a college student or whatever it is, you want to preserve money, this is my recommendation for you. This is called One Man Show. This is a fantastic fragrance. Thomas from Early Greek said it best. He goes, there's no fucking around with this fragrance. It just basically presents the accord to you. It says, oh, you want an Oud note? Here you go. Here's your Oud Accord. Uh, they do mix it with a little bit of galbanum. It's a little green. Um, there's red thyme, so it's green, red thyme, bergamot, Oud, spices, geranium, leather, patchouli, and papyrus. And that papyrus gives it a very um, burnt, you know, like uh, imagine a papyrus scroll on fire. But the Oud Accord here is very good. Some people compare this to uh, Ombre Nomad by Louis Vuitton, which I have reviewed on the channel. Some people compare it to um, Leather Oud, which I will review on the channel. But for 20 bucks, or I don't even think I paid 20 bucks. I think I paid like $18 for this. Um, One Man Show Oud Edition is a proper Oud. It's, it's, a, it's a good fragrance. And, and if hopefully in a perfect world, I can review every single one of my fragrances before um, before I'm not able to, but, um, uh, but yes, I do plan on reviewing that one day. One Man Show Oud Edition by Jacques Bogart. I don't know how, by the way, Jacques Bogart makes money at $20 a pop. I have no clue. Absolutely no clue. Um, okay. Number 30 is actually a pretty hard to find fragrance. And I have since smelled a fragrance that I think smells better than this that I want. And it's one of the reasons this is closer to the end of the list as well. Uh, I, some may argue it's a better fragrance than where I'm putting it here. Um, I have heard some people say this is like a modern Antaeus. Completely disagree. I, I disagree with that completely. But um, it's Salvatore Fettigamo's Testa di Morto. So this is kind of like a modern suede fragrance. Um, there's, a, there's a suede note in here um, that is pretty well done. But one of the problems is it's a very quiet fragrance on me. I really wish that it just had more oomph, if you will. I've um, tried to let air in the bottle and stuff like that. I, I need to let more air in. Um, but yeah, I mean, right off of the bat, you're kind of hit with that sort of um, woody, spicy, smoky oud. I think it used to be called incense suede. So you get frankincense and dried fruits. There's some dried fruits in here, and, you, and it's mixed with saffron and leather. So obviously that saffron leather combination, some people will instantly harken back to Tom Ford's Tuscan Leather. And I would say, you know, they're both modern leather iterations, but um, this uses more waxy Styrax and there's a mate tea note in here and sandalwood. Um, I, um, I found a fragrance from Orto Parisi, which I think does this style of perfume better. It's called Sturkis. I've got a, um, a decant and I'll, and I'll do a review, a uh, quick, early impression or late night insight one day off of that decan of Sturkis that was sent to me by one of my perfume god people who want to remain anonymous. But um, Testa di Morto, it used to be called Incense Suede, and you definitely get this Incense Suede like a chord, go figure. But um, Fabrice Pelligran is the perfumer. I think it's still available, but these are really hard to find for some reason. I have no clue why. Um, they're just, they're just, uh, I don't know if it's the distribution of Salvatore Ferragamo. I don't know if it's this particular line, this higher end line. You know, this is supposed to look like real leather. I don't know if you can see that. So this is supposed to be like the higher end Salvatore Ferragamo fragrances. Um, and I like the fragrance. It's just, I wish it had more oomph and Sturkis, I think really fixes that for me. So, so yeah, still a good fragrance, but, um, I'm going to, I'm going to look for a bottle of Sturkis one day. Uh, so that's number 20, sorry, number 30. Number 29 is a discontinued flanker of a designer fragrance from the house of Fendi. Fendi, um, has one of my favorite old school leather fragrances called Fendi Womo from the late 80s. I will do a review on that, uh, one of these days, but this is called Fan de Fendi. And Fan de Fendi, um, has, ha came out, uh, I think a year or two before this, um, 
That's also discontinued, but this is the flanker from 2014 uh, called Asaluto. And really the only way to tell is the darker juice. And at the bottom, you've got to kind of read the writing. It says Asaluto down here, right there. Um, I think it says it right there. Yes, right there. And so, fan defendi por om Asaluto. So, uh, Asaluto is like a sort of a uh, oud version of fan defendi. <laughs> And so they've added oud, they've amped up the apopanax, so sweet myrrh and resins and stuff like that. But to be honest with you, I prefer the original. I think this is still a really good flanker, and it's what a good designer fragrance should be. I'm sad that this is discontinued, to be honest with you. I've got 100 mil of the flanker, and I've got 50 mil of the OG. I wish it was switched, where I had 100 mils of the, of the original, because I really think the original is a example of a well-made designer masculine fragrance for for men um lvmh owns fendi but i never see them really putting out many fendi fragrances i don't know what they're doing with the brand um but this is good i mean it's a spicy oriental it does feel like a designer though but it's a well it's a good example of a of a designer uh and i think it was a francois de machi and maybe a bunch of other perfumers kind of came together at least on the original they did it was fan it was uh francois de machi delphine lebeau Cro croiac croiac and benoit la pausa so um uh Fa fendi fan de fendi Asaluto at number 29 number 28 is a roja and it is a roja i reviewed on the channel it is called reckless pour homme this is also discontinued. This just got discontinued at the end of 2023. And you can see I basically used up all but just a couple mils there. Um, and this is Roja's take on Clive Christian X, but I prefer Clive Christian X. One of the few times I prefer the Clive Christian, which that rarely happens. Usually I think Clive Christian is an inferior house. But um, in this case, Reckless uh, is a nice fragrance. Go check out my full review if you want to kind of learn more. This is the Eau de Parfum. And it really had some serious um, issues with uh, performance. And uh, I enjoy the smell. It's a beautiful, masculine, spicy. I really like kind of the cardamom and peppery clove combination that's used in here. There's a vintage lavender and, and artemisia and bay leaves and stuff like that. Um, but it is just, it's, it, it feels like it's missing a lot. It feels like it's missing a lot. It's beautiful for a couple hours. I mean, if money's no issue and you just reapply every couple hours and that's kind of your signature scent, it's a beautiful fragrance, but I would just wear X. I think Clive Christian's X for Men just does that version better. Um, but I but I like Reckless Pour Homme. I'd never buy it because of the terrible performance. Um, and number 28, number 27 is another discontinued fragrance. So look at this. I mean, these houses, they put something out and I mean, within years of coming out, they discontinue it. Uh, and they just don't care because they just put something else out, you know. And since our culture now is all about buying whatever the new toy is, it's like the dog with the squirrel, you know. Um, they, they're they just like, well, screw it. We'll just discontinue it and put out something else. And that's what they do. So this is from the Aramis Perfume Calligraphy Collection. And this is the final one from the collection. If you've been watching these this year in perfume videos, you notice the first one in 2012, the flanker of uh, Rose in 2013. And now we have Perfume Calligraphy Saffron, which is probably one of my favorites from the line. I need to review these for you guys. Um, it is discontinued and hard to find, but I really like the um, take on Saffron. This is a well-made uh, fragrance. It is spicy and oriental in, in style, and they basically use this notes of, uh, it looks like Tegetz, but it's actually pronounced Tegetz, if I'm not mistaken, Tegetz. Um, and... Tajits is a very dry smelling plant. They use it actually to keep bugs away. Bugs do not like the smell of it. So in a garden, if you have some, uh, if you have this, it's also known as marigold. If you have this marigold, um, it will keep away. It'll keep the bugs away. Uh, it's like a natural bug. Uh, you don't have to spray yourself with off or anything like that. And they've mixed it with this beautiful saffron and, and saffron and rose. And, but what they've done is they've used lavender in that waxy smelling styrax. So, yeah, I love, and you know what, the, um, you know what's so beautiful about this is the saffron in here takes on this honeyed-like feeling. So it's like a honey saffron. It really almost smells like the color of the juice. Um, if you look at the color of, of the, of the label, this sort of honeyed golden saffron 
with a beautiful Turkish rose absolute and lavender and this waxy styrax and tonka and vetiver in the base. Um, I, I like this a lot. This is probably my favorite. I think this is my favorite from the three. I think the rose is probably uh, traditionally the most feminine leaning. And even though this has a big Turkish rose absolute note, that honeyed saffron in here, that chemical smelling saffron is beautiful. I love it. You know, Middle Eastern style fragrance without using oud. Um, very well done by, by um, Aramis. Very well done. And of course, these were targeted towards the Middle East. So many in the United States, like us, we never, we never saw it in stores. It never made stores here because it was really made for the Middle East. But if you look around, sometimes you'll find a bottle for a very good price. So that is number 27, Aramis Perfume Calligraphy Saffron. Number 26 is a Davidoff fragrance. And this is called Leather Blend. And speaking of Davidoff, I mean, I've talked about some vintage Davidoff fragrances. There's a, a Davidoff it's called Davidoff Davidoff for men, I think, from, from the mid-80s, which I'll be doing a full review on. That is one of my favorite Davidoffs of all time. And also, of course, Zeno. Davidoff Zeno. You can't go wrong with Zeno. It's absolutely beautiful um, and really, I think, really lit the fire under that category of amber, fougere, whatever you want to call it. It's a Michelle Almarac who's a master perfumer. Um, so, And then after that, Davidoff had Cool Water, of course, which was a huge hit, and everyone... Um, loved Cool Water at the time, but Cool Water didn't age very well to me. I would rather wear Green Irish Green Irish Tweed. Um, and, and then Davidoff just sort of, I don't want to say they fell off the map, but they just kind of disappeared. They didn't release very much that was interesting. They were still releasing stuff, but I don't think very little appealed to the fragrance community. But these right here, um, these sort of Middle Eastern style Davidoffs, I like. I like this and I like Amber Blend. And obviously, you know, they're creating a Middle Eastern uh, targeted line, very similar to what the Aramis was just doing in, in, in the uh, previous, um, in, in the previous um, fragrance. And, but Leather Blend is discontinued. Um, and it also uses saffron and rose, but instead they mix it with leather in this dark papyrus. So, um, I know there have been some folks that have been very hard on this line because they can smell amber woods and stuff like that. And obviously it's there, but I don't think it's used in a negative way. I think the perfumer who is uh, Christophe Reynaud, uh, Christophe Reynaud did a pretty good job with this one. Um, I think it's probably like a hundred bucks or less. Like if you can get this for a hundred dollars or less and you like these style of fragrances, go for it. Um... The amber is also very good. It's a it's a well made designer amber, but um, leather blend, leathery, woody, peppery. You know the saffron adds that Middle Eastern chemical vibe. Um, saffron sometimes gives me feels of like rolling sand dunes, like you're in the Mojave Desert or whatever, looking at the sand dunes. It's um, but it's very well done. I think it's very well done. I like this. I like this better than 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 some. Um, Leather Blend by, by uh, Davidoff at number 26. Number 25 is a Dior, and it is a flanker of a fragrance I wore as my scent of the day yesterday, which was uh, the Great Fahrenheit. This is a flanker from, from 2014, hence why it's in my 2014 video, and this is called Fahrenheit Le Parfum. Well, actually, I take that back. It used to be called Le Parfum early on, and then I think they just changed the name to Fahrenheit Parfum. Um, and Parfum is sort of a sweeter, spicier, uh, I take that back. It's a sweeter and, and the gasoline accord in the opening is toned down. Uh, they've added this big vanilla. So I always gave this uh, a hard time because I like the original Fahrenheit. I'm a fan of the OG and I'm a fan of Fahrenheit Absolute, which is for me, it would be the OG and then Fahrenheit Absolute. And this is like the last place Fahrenheit. So I always... Put this on the back burner and it's true i mean for my for my style right if you like vintage fragrances get the og fahrenheit get the original fahrenheit um but i will say this even though i've been very hard on this fragrance um the the more i get to know it the more i i think i realize that i don't necessarily hate the fragrance i just don't think there's very much space in fahrenheit for vanilla but if you like this type of, um, like if you're into sweeter or if you really like um, sort of 
Um, uh, if you like boozy vanilla or whatever you, we want to call it, a lot of folks say there's a boozy feeling to this. I, I don't know if I agree with that. I think maybe they're reading bourbon vanilla and they think bourbon means like actual bourbon in the glass. I don't think they realize that that's just a type of vanilla because I don't get this big boozy vibe that they get. Maybe a little bit, um, but I also think maybe some of that is mental. It's, um, it is sort of a amped up vanillic version of Fahrenheit where the gasoline uh, opening and the leather harsh masculine accords. It's almost like a, a unis more you like they tried to make Fahrenheit more feminine leaning, if that makes sense. Uh, I think Fahrenheit on its own is unisex. I don't think it needed to be made unisex. I think the original Fahrenheit had a ton of florals in there. And um, so the leather sometimes feels suede-like. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't feel as rough and tumble as the OG in, in the dry down. In, in the dry down of the original, sometimes that leather dry down can be somewhat harsh. The leather here feels more approachable okay it feels it feels like uh it's been taken to get a haircut and it's been given the speech hey it's 2024 now um you can't say some of the things you used to say in the 80s and and fahrenheit is with the program that's kind of what it feels like um but fahrenheit le parfum at number 25 number 24 is a decant i uh, can't find nor do i have the time to dig through all my decants and try to find it for you guys but I reviewed it within the last couple months it's from the house of olympic orchids and it's called wood cut at number 24 a really uh, well-made uh, woody fragrance. Go figure. It's named Woodcut. It's like a resinous woody fragrance uh, with some pine and, and frankincense, cedar, tolu balsam, vanilla. Go check out my review if you want to see more about that one. And the, actually smelling that made me want to smell more from the brand. So I want to smell more from Olympic or Orchids. Um, and then number 23 is another decant from uh, a, a brand that I've done a review on on the channel. So I put it in the... Um, Rankings, it's from the House of Roja, Roja Parfums, and it's called Goodman's. And Goodman's, uh, I believe the way he did it is Goodman's was marketed towards men, and Bergdorf, because it's Bergdorf Goodman's, if I'm not mistaken, was marketed towards women. So uh, they were both made for Bergdorf Goodman's, but Goodman's was the masculine version, and that's the one that I've reviewed on the channel. It's kind of like a spicy Sheepra. It reminded me a lot of um, Roja's Herod or, or Herod's Pour Homme, uh, which I also have a review on on the channel. You can check that out. His his fragrances that he made for these department stores felt very, um, very safe and wearable versions, like something that someone who goes to an office every day and wants to smell professional, but also wants to wants someone to think that they dropped a lot of money on a fragrance. Um, you know, hint, hint on, on the Amafi, like I was talking about earlier. Um, that's kind of the way that the, but actually I like the Roja way more than I like the Amafi. So, um, but go check out my review on Roja's Goodman's, which apparently is sadly discontinued because that was a good one from at number 23. Number 22 is another Roja. This time it is H the Exclusive Oud Parfum, which is also discontinued. Uh, so obviously Roja was putting out a ton of stuff back then. H the Exclusive Oud had an oregano note, which was a big hit. And you can see I only have maybe, you know, one or two wearings tops left. HD Exclusive Oud um, used that oregano note, which was a huge hit with Interlude Man. That came out a couple years before HD Exclusive Oud came out. And so this has a lot of that Cipriol Oud combination. Uh, but check out my review if you want the details on it. I remember it being very spicy and earthy and, and, and wearable, but... Um, but yes, for someone who maybe wants an oud without with a very wearable oud, if you don't like the funky animalic ouds that, that I like, check out H the Exclusive Oud if you can find a bottle for a good deal. Okay, so that was number 22. Number 21 is a fragrance that was created by Comme des Garçons, and it was created by a brand, uh, a celebrity brand, Pharrell Williams. It was his celebrity brand. I think this is the only fragrance ever put out for this brand, but it was called... Girl. It is also sadly discontinued. And Girl is sort of a niche take on Fahrenheit. So if you've, if you've smelled, um, 
fragrances like uh, Narciso Rodriguez for him, if you smelled the OG Fahrenheit. Imagine kind of taking those two and blending them together. This has this white pepper and lavender combination with this neroli, which really softens it up. Neroli sometimes adds this sort of fresh soapiness to it. So imagine like a, a very professional opening, but there's a beautiful iris and styrax and violet in here. So it keeps the violet, but it doesn't smell like the old school violet leaf. Um, it's just a beautiful purple iris with sandalwood, lovely sandalwood and vetiver, patchouli and cedar into the dry down. Uh, I need to do a full review on this, but you know, I got this for something. It's a tester. I got it for like 20, 15, 20 bucks or something. Very, very cheap. And now bottles sell for hundreds. Um, but I do think it's a good design. Well, technically Comedy Garçon is a niche, but it was priced like a designer. It was at discounters for the longest time. People didn't want it. Uh, but I think they really overlooked it. And I think the name was part of it, Girl. They they saw Girl and they were like, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. You know, there's pink on here. Um, the bottle's very strange. You know, whoever this guy is just looks like he got murdered. And so um, I think a lot of people just kind of stayed away from it or didn't give it a chance. But this is really good stuff. Um, I'm a fan. If you like Narciso Rodriguez for um, for him, the original from 2007... I think Rich Mitch just did a review of that one as well. Check out Girl. Girl is uh, Girl's really good at number 21. Number 20 is another decant, which I have a comparison video, I believe, on the channel from memory, uh, Rhinoceros. And I compared the 2014 Rhinoceros, which I much prefer, to the 2017, I think, right? Uh, more modern Rhinoceros, which was done by Prin Lomros. I much prefer the version by Paul Killer. Um... Uh, I, I just remember it being much more in my wheelhouse, that leathery, smoky, it was, it was, uh, believe it or not, I thought it was, um, it was not heavier, but it was like braver, you know, it was a braver release. I didn't like what they redid to Rhinoceros as much. I like the original from 2014. Uh, yeah, in 2017, they uh, reclassified it as an extra de parfum, and apparently Prin Lamras, um, sort of reworked the scent, if you will. But I have a comparison video on the channel. Go check that out. Um, so Rhinoceros, the OG from 2014. I'd love a vintage bottle one day. I would not mind that at all. Number 19 is Erosia. And it is a Erosia that is discontinued because I believe... Well, actually, uh, I have to take that back. It's not discontinued. They just changed the name. So when it first came out, it was originally called Erosia's Taif Oud. Okay? Uh, and then, I think a year or two ago... They re-released it as Fortnum and Mason Taif Oud, okay? So, um, I have a review from, I believe, one of the original Taif Oud bottles. I think the brand says there's no difference, there was no reformulation, just sort of a name change. But it's kind of like a floral oriental with a lot, I remember smelling a lot of Cipriol in the opening. And, you know, around that time I was reviewing things like Malik Al Taif and stuff like that. So, so... Smelling Taif Oud, something that in Roja's pictures shows with real Taif roses and real Oud, and then comparing it to Russian Adams' work, um, it, it was tough to accept that he was selling this bottle for like $795 or something. It was not cheap at all. Uh, and But I did enjoy the, the fragrance for what it was. But if you go in expecting to smell, to me anyways, what smells like real Oud and real Taif rose and stuff like that, you're going to be let down. You know, they... They smell like accords to me. Uh, that's that's the way that I would put it. And that's a good way, I think, to put it for the whole Roja brand when it comes to the Oud side of things. But I did enjoy it at number 19. Go check out my full review if you're interested in learning more. Number 18 is a fragrance that a friend in the community very kindly gifted to me. And um, he or she would like to remain anonymous. So thank you very much. This is called Bergamask by Orito Parisi. And I'll tell you what, I am really digging this house. Um... Uh, Alessandro Galtieri has some hella, he's got some amazing releases under his belt, and, um, I'm gonna talk about things like Bergamask and Quoium this year on the channel, God willing, but, um, this is his take on a citrusy fresh fragrance, which is not his forte at all, and you would think, oh man, it's gonna suck. The only downside with this is sometimes that synthetic smell comes through even more because it's, um, citrusy and fresh, and I feel like it doesn't have as many heavy notes to mask 
some of his, um, you could call it Amber Woods or whatever you want to call it, but I actually really enjoy his work. And I think if you wanted like an example of a fragrance that properly uses those type of materials that everyone gives perfumers such a hard time for, this is a good example of that. That citrus note in the top is very interesting because it sits on this kind of animalic musk, but in a, in a fresh sort of uplifting way. There's like a, I don't know, like a woody, spicy, animalic sort of undertone, but enough that it allows that citrusy freshness to shine through, but it's done in a way where you still get that, like, imagine if Francis Kirkjohn took that synthetic side of his creations, which I talked a little bit about in my Seal de Gum review, but I'll talk even more about when I do a full review of Absolute Pour Le Soir. That synthetic, I heard somebody refer to it as like doll hair, like imagine like the hair of a doll straight out of the package, this synthetic just smell. Um, and Galtieri seems to use these type of ingredients that other perfumers um, maybe shy away from or maybe get flack for using, but he uses them in a way where he's not ashamed of it at all. Like I said in, in the um, Ciel de Gum review, you know, Francis Kirkjohn just loves to show those synthetic uh, notes front and center. And uh, Galtieri does something similar, but imagine just turning it up. Like he doesn't have, it doesn't feel like he's trying to appeal to a mass audience of people like Francis Kirkjohn is. It really feels like He's just creating these very outlandish, out there fragrances, and I really like that. I love Orto Prodizzi, and I want to collect more from the brand. There's so many more I want to collect and smell and all that good stuff. But um, yes, Burga Mask at number 18. Number 17. Uh, number 17 barely beat out number 18, because I've been enjoying getting to know Burga Mask more since this bottle showed up. Uh, but this is called Floris Leather Oud. And I'll tell you what, for someone who loves real oud, who got to know the Ensars, the Arizadori, the Bortnikovs over the last couple of years, you might be surprised I like this, but I actually really, really like this fragrance. Um, I don't know anything about the brand. Actually, I'm completely ignorant about the brand of Floris, but what I like about leather oud, Floris' leather oud, um, you got to be careful because there's a Dior leather oud, there's so many leather ouds now, but uh, Floris' leather oud is kind of like this... Um, it's kind of like this very gentlemanly oud. Um, and it feels, obviously it feels like it has that liqueur oud feeling. You get it from the beginning. You also get the leather from the beginning. But I feel like there's a lot of, the notes are geranium and carnation and patchouli. And I feel like you do get some of this sort of green, spicy geranium or, or, you know, maybe some, um, I don't know, maybe like the greenness of the vetiver or, or something that, um, just makes the fragrance feel very traditionally masculine, but wearable. You know what I mean? Like, yes, it's oud. Yes, it's leather, but there's something very classy about it. Uh, Floris is known as like the James Bond brand. Apparently that was like the brand that James Bond used to wear in the books or something. I don't remember. Um, and here, they've taken a genre which, obviously, oud was like the thing, right? After Tom Ford's oud wood, and, and every house who was anyone had an oud by 2014. And they were taking something that was contemporary with that oud accord, and they were staying true to their house's kind of tailored, well, you know, buttoned-up man feel. There's, there's a lot of that in here. I wouldn't be surprised if there was maybe a little bit of lavender or something like that. Um... Very well done. It, I am shocked by how much I like this. Shocked. I uh, bought this on a whim. I got it for a really good price. I think I got this from Duncan. I can't remember. Or um, maybe Sticks. Stick Schlonghammer, which maybe is the best YouTube handle in the world. Uh, but I think it was Sticks. now that I'm talking about it out loud. Yes, thank you, Sticks. Um, leather Oud for... And thank you for always being fair to me, my friend. Uh, okay, number 16 is a discontinued Bentley fragrance that is supposed to smell like the famed Gucci Pour Homme from 2003, which I will review on the channel. Uh, and this is called Bentley for Men Absolute, okay? Bentley for Men Absolute is the sort of other Bentley flanker. Everyone talks about Bentley for Men Intense, which I do really enjoy. It's very boozy. Um, Bentley for Men 
Absolute is a, um, what's interesting about this is it's a fragrance that was created by the exact same perfumer who made Bentley, or who made Gucci Pour Homme from 2003, Michel Almarac, when he was at Robertet, he made this. And um, then he went and created his own brand called Par Parlemoi de Parfum, which I've never smelled or talked about on the channel. But he created a fragrance called Papyrus Oud slash 71, something along those lines. And um, so they're uh, it's supposed to be the exact same uh, formula from what I've heard. But I think maybe what makes it different, the Parlemoi de Parfum, and the Bentley for Men Absolute and the Gucci Pour Homme, the original, is the quality of the ingredients. That's my guess. I would guess that in order to sell this as a cheapie, you know, at a discount site or whatever it is for 30 bucks or whatever these go for or went for, who knows what they go for now that it's discontinued, but um, that the ingredients were probably not as high quality as the original Gucci or maybe his new niche brand, Parle Mois de Far Parfum. But this also has an oud note in it. The original Gucci Pour Homme did not have an oud note in 2003. Um, but this very dry, resinous, smoky, spicy, you know, you get that incense, that frankincense and woods. And if you like Gucci Pour Homme, you'll like this. My guess is I would like Parlemois de Parfums, um, uh, oh gosh, my memory, Papyrus Oud. And there's definitely that dry papyrus scroll being burnt feeling, which I love. Moss, amber, it's woody, smoky, spicy. Very well done by Bentley. And I, I've said it before, and, I, and I'll stick by this. I've said it with the Ancre Noir fragrances. I said it, and I'll say it again, actually, because there's another one coming up as we go on in this video. But Lalique, who makes these Bentley fragrances, um, Lalique is maybe one of the best value houses. As far as value for money goes, Lalique makes some amazing fragrances for, for so cheap. Them and Jacques Bogart are two that, man, if you're on a budget... That's, that's definitely the way to go to get lots of fragrances in your collection and not spend a lot of money. So Bentley for Men Absolute at number 16. Number 15 is a Nishane, and it is called Sultan Vetiver. I've done a full review on the channel. You can check it out. Uh, this is kind of like King Vetiver. There's like four different types of vetivers in here. Java Vetiver, Bourbon Vetiver, Haitian Vetiver, and Brazilian Vetiver. Um, and I think if you look at the note listing, there's literally an amber wood note listing. And I think a lot of people see that and they don't really give this fragrance a chance. I, you know, obviously I get the amber woods in the dry down. It's what makes it so tenacious, but I love this fragrance. I think it's an amazing vetiver. Green, spicy. I love the absinthe. It's just fantastic. Um, some people compare this to Bortnikoff's Vetiver Nocturne, which I have yet to smell. That's on my wish list. Um, I've been going through my Bortnikoff week just ended. So, you know, there's an entire Bortnikoff playlist if you're interested in learning about that house. But more Nishane reviews to come. I need to review. Um, there's a couple that are top of mind, especially Fan Your Flames, which I really like. One of the... One of my guilty pleasures, because it's like a sweet tobacco rum thing with coconut. I really like Fan Your Flames. Um, so yes, a house that you will be hearing more about on the channel. But if you're a vetiver lover and you want something that is, you know, if you're tired of the traditional vetivers, the carbon vetivers, the Guerlain vetivers, and you want something more modern, check out Sultan Vetiver. Uh, I think you... Um, I think if you're, especially if you're a vetiver lover, you owe it to yourself to, to try it. I'm a fan. Some people are not, but, but I'm a fan. Uh, and I have a review where I talk about some of those pros and cons on the channel. Okay, next on the list. Next on the list, we have a decant, which um, I could not find. But uh, again, there's a review on the channel. If you go to the Orto Parisi playlist or just search for it, you'll find it. The name of the fragrance is called Bocanera. And I really enjoyed this review. If you just look up Bocanera on his uh, website, it's let's just say it's all about holes, okay? It's all about holes. And you take that and run with it wherever you want to go, and that's probably exactly where Galtieri was going with it. He's He doesn't give note listings. That's the other thing. So you have to kind of infer for yourself what you're smelling, which I like. Um, but it's it was a very woody, spicy, oody... Uh, animalic smell. I, I enjoyed it. Go check out my review on Bocanada at number uh, 14. I'd love a bottle of some of those Orto Parisis. 
Number 13 is Erosia, another one that came off of a sample, and it was called United Arab Emirates. I really enjoyed that one. Uh, I think it was full bottle worthy. If I was collecting more from this Middle Eastern line, they basically look like this. Uh, this is the only one that looks like this that I have in my collection. Uh, it is called um, Sultanate of Oman. Um, I've got a full review on Sultanate of Oman or a comparison video between the vintage bottle, which is right there, and this one. But uh, United Arab Emirates com comes in a similar bottle, but of course each one of the plates is sort of an homage to the country. So it's got the famous UAE towers, if you will, and it's kind of like an oriental floral. Uh, and But I enjoyed the sort of, um, from memory, I enjoyed the cumin, cumin-y, oudy feeling. And there's some really interesting cumin oud fragrances out there. Some people compare it to Roja's Taif Oud, and I definitely could see some similarities, but I could also see owning them both, because I, I enjoyed that type of scent profile, but um, very expensive, hard to find. Uh, well, not hard to find, but um, they're just very expensive fragrances, so you kind of have to pick and choose, unless you're just rolling in dough. Okay, next on the list, we have a Tiziana Terenzi. Actually, I have to give this fragrance its due. Uh, this was sent to me by my good friend A2 from the channel. You'll um, you'll see him in reviews and stuff like that. This is called Ladano Netto. He said, hey man, I'm getting rid of some fragrances. Do you want any of these? I said, yes, I definitely want this one because I reviewed it off of a um, sample. And I thought it was a very interesting take on uh, labdanum. But Ladano Netto. But the thing about it is if you want just a pure out and out uh, labdanum, you know, I, well, it's not an out and out labdanum, but probably more of the, I would say, let's say more accepted, okay, more accepted, uh, uh, labdanums would be something like Le Lyon or Sahara Noir by Tom Ford, which is on the top of my wish list for, uh, labdanum fragrances to have in the collection, both of which I have reviewed on the channel, um, and I've reviewed Ladano Nero, but off of a sample, but the reason I wanted this is because, Ladano Nero kind of takes that labdanum heavy feel. Um, if you smell the Zoo's Everlasting, that was another very heavy labdanum, but it makes it sort of in this crass. Uh, Tiziana Terenzi has this style. It's very, uh, I would say, unapologetic, okay? Does not apologize for what it's doing. It just throws these hardcore animalic. You get things like cognac and um, you get this camphor honeyed feel, um, cashmere, cashmeran, uh, all of these weird, well, not weird, but, well, there are some weird notes in here because there's a caper note, which you don't get very often, other than when you're eating pastas, and um, vetiver and oak, and there's all of these different notes, but it's given to you, you know, it's presented to you almost in like a modern Middle Eastern niche Beast Mode, like for the Beast Mode bros, Tiziana Terenzi is famous with the Beast Mode bros. They love Tiziana Terenzi because the shit lasts forever. But it's done in a way that I actually enjoy. There's some amberwood heavy fragrances that I just can't wear. This is one I actually really liked. And it's, it's, it's good enough that it makes me want to smell more from the brand. So, yes, I like these sort of heavy. And if you like vintage masculines, there's something... You know, there is definitely a connection when you're smelling these heavy, old-school fragrances with oak moss and stuff like that. And some of these more modern um, niche fragrances that try to do the beast mode thing. There's definitely, there can be a comparison to, to vintage perfumery and just the way it's done. Obviously, the materials are completely different. And some people just can't take the um, amber woody feel. But I, I really like this. It's like an oud sort of... Middle Eastern style labdanum, and I, I enjoy it. Go check out my uh, review of um, Ladano Nero at number, where are we? Number 12. Number 11 is a flanker, probably one of the best flankers. Um, I know I mentioned that the best flanker of all time for me is Bellamy Vetiver, hands down, but this is probably up there in top five flankers. Uh, this is from the House of Lalique. Again, I'm telling you, Lalique hits hard, and this is called Lalique Homage à l'Homme. Voyager. So the original Homage Alom, I think, came out uh, four or maybe even five years before Voyager. Um, and Voyager is done by Michelle Almarak, the same person who did Bentley for Men Absolute. 
And um, so Voyager is sort of this spicy, woody, some people compare it to uh, Giorgio Arm Armani's Attitude, which I've never smelled. For me, it's almost like a designer version of Javoy's Private Label. And the reason I say that is that papyrus note. So there's a papyrus note in Private Label that, um, and I actually prefer Private Label by Javoy uh, to Homage à Lone Voyager, but for a designer, this is fantastic stuff. I think, um, I think Michelle Almarac hit it on the head, and there is something about that papyrus note which links to the papyrus uh, oud or whatever I said in Parle Moi de Parfum or Bentley from Man Absolute. There's something that links this papyrus. You can definitely see he was working with this papyrus note, and I like that. Very cool, you know, sterile, like you just walked into like an ancient library where it's untouched, you know, there's a ton of books. Doesn't smell moldy though, but it just smells old, you know? There's this ancient feel, and the papyrus just feels like, um, yes, it's old, but it's held up over time, if that makes sense. It doesn't feel rotten necessarily, but you definitely get that dry, papery papyrus feel, which is so beautiful. That's the star of the show in uh, Homage à Lone Voyager, mixed with cardamom and bergamot and patchouli, Patchouli gives it that heft, you know? It's not a chocolatey patchouli, but it adds to that dank feeling of the library, you know, that has been unused for a long time. Green vetiver, mosses, ambers, and vanilla in the vase. Very masculine, very spicy and woody. And even though there's vanilla, it's not a sweet modern vanilla. There's something very vintage about this scent. Definitely one of the greatest flankers of all time, in my opinion. Homage à l'homme voyager. Sadly discontinued. So... Both of these Laliques that I highlighted from 2014 are already discontinued a decade later. Very sad. Um, okay, next on the list. Next on the list, we have uh, number 10, top 10. So number 10 is a Chanel. And it is a version of a Chanel which came out long before in the late 80s. And it was called Chanel Pour Monsieur Eau de Toilette Concentré. And so what ended up happening was, in 2014, they re-released it, and we don't know whether... Here's the blurb. It says, according to our information, this scent is meant to replace Pour Monsieur Eau de Toilette Concentré starting from, starting from 2014. As this happened, without any announcement from Chanel, it is not possible to state whether Pour Monsieur the Eau de Parfum, which is given credit as coming out in 2014, Chanel's Pour, Pour Monsieur Eau de Parfum, is comes up as a mere renaming of Pour Monsieur or an actual formula concentration adjustment. And I actually have the Eau de Toilette Concentrate, so that'll make a hell of a comparison video one day. I can tell you to my nose, this smells a little bit sweeter. It smells a little bit sweeter. And so even if there wasn't a true proper um, reformulation, maybe they tweaked it a little bit to, for modern noses. I don't know, but one thing that I can tell you that may shock you guys is I much prefer the Eau de Parfum and Eau de Toilette Concentré than I do to the original 1950s Chanel Pour Monsieur, the EDT. Um, the EDT is challenging for me to wear. and uh, Challenging in the sense that I don't get the satisfaction out of it that I get when I wear the Eau de Parfum or the Eau de Toilette Concentré. I think this is a very good fragrance, a very good, like for a designer side of Chanel, this is fantastic. It's so classy. It's everything people say the Eau de Toilette is. Everyone says, oh, the Eau de Toilette is so, you know, it's old money, classy. It doesn't have to shout. It's, you know, it's so classy. It doesn't have to shout. Yeah, but I still want to smell the damn thing. I don't want it to be gone in 30 minutes. Um, this does all that for me, but it does it in a way where it satisfies my need to be able to break down a scent throughout the day. I can still smell it and enjoy it on me and stuff like that. So I much prefer the Eau de Parfum or, or Eau de Toilette Concentré. But I'll do a comparison video between the two one day. I think that'll be fantastic. From memory, probably the biggest difference is the Eau de Toilette Concentré has more real oak moss in it. And here they're using some sort of substitute or took it out completely. And maybe they amped up the vanilla to replace it. To, and also to try to, you know, harmonize with modern noses. I, that's my guess. Um, so that's number 10, Chanel Pour Monsieur Eau de Parfum from 2014. Number nine. Uh, number nine is probably one of my favorite um, 
musks that doesn't use real musk, although it's a little bit of a tricky subject because in, in this fragrance is what's called muscanone, which basically is a musk ingredient that is produced by Ferminiche and is, but is the, um, has elements of real musk, not elements of real musk. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, maybe someone who knows better can better describe what I'm trying to say. Uh, but it's very close, let's say, to, um, to, it's as close as they can get in modern perfumery without using, because obviously they're not going to use real deer musk, right? So it's like a derivative of real deer musk. That's what I'm trying to say. And it's called Musk Tonkin from Parfum d'Empire. This is an amazing French brand and definitely one I, you'll be hearing more about on the channel. Uh, I have reviewed, I think I've reviewed one or two from this from this house. I can't remember, but you will see more reviews on, on the channel. This is the vintage Eau de Parfum. They don't make the Eau de Parfum anymore. They make the Eau, they make the X-Ray, which um, comes in a 50 mil instead of a 100 mil. So I really, really like this fragrance. I'll tell you what, and it is just an amazing musk. Um, it's musk mixed with hyracium. Hyracium is a very challenging animalic note. Oh, it's so good. You know, and, and some men may smell this and go, no way, no how. The tuberose note in here is too long, too huge along with the rose. Give it time to settle because it settles into this resinous, um, God, what a musk fragrance this is. I think I like this more than Serge's uh, Musk Kublai Khan. I don't say that very, very few niche houses can compete with Serge. Like when you're going head to head with Serge, Serge wins, period. I mean, it just is. Um, but for me, this is something special. Uh, I've never smelled the X-ray, so I don't know. But this is, man, some people compare this to um, Absolute Pour Le Soir by, uh, by um, Francis Kirkjohn, which I, MFK, which I will review soon for you guys. But uh, Must Tonkin is, oh my God. Man, that resinous myrrh in the base too. I mean, just the color of the juice is a great indication, but that tuberose rose combo is there, but the hyracium, the animalics give it just enough, like, I mean, they give it just enough um, oomph, if that makes sense. What a musk fragrance this is. Uh, what a house. Parfum d'Empire is something special. Definitely a house I want to spend more time getting to know and talking about on the channel. Um, so that's number nine. Number eight. Number eight, remember when I we when, when we began this uh, journey together an hour ago, I put Frank Bachwitz tobacco towards the end, like number 35. And I said, because there's another fragrance I've been getting to know that does that style of fragrance better to me. And unfortunately, it is discontinued, which when I heard this, I was like, what? I can't believe that because I thought this brand was not known for uh, discontinuing stuff. It's from the house of Naomi Goodsir at number eight, and it's called Or de Sorel. This is the vintage bottle. They have new bottles now, so they're going to look a little different than this. I don't know. I think this brand keeps their stuff solid, so I don't think you have to worry about reformulation. But this, oh my god. I'll tell you what, if you like tobacco vanille and you trust the Ram, and you can still find this for a good price, I don't know what prices are, but fuck. I mean, Bertrand du Chaffour has worked some magic with Or de Sorel. Because when you smell it, instantly you get this fruitiness. You get this red fruit and mango combination. And of course, Bertrand du Chaffour used mango in um, his very famous L'Artisan perfume, which um, of course I'm drawing a blank on, which always pisses me off. Now I have to know, um, what the hell is it called? It is called... Timbuktu, of course, I should have known that, Timbuktu. Sometimes it's easier to just grab the damn bottle than look it up, because uh, I know where everything is in my collection. So, Or du Sorel, yes, it's sweet, yes, it's fruity. It's a little boozy, because there's a rum note, but you cannot miss that tobacco vanille feel, right? It's like Bertrand du Chaffour takes tobacco vanille and adds these exotic fruits, right? And so, yes, you get the tobacco absolute. Yes, you get the vanilla absolute. It's ambery, it's labdanum, it's woody, it's musky, it's floral, but it's a Bertrand du Chaffour. So it has Divana. It has um, these very exotic and, and fruits that you just would not think go in a fragrance like this. Obviously, Tobacco Vanille has dried fruits or a dried fruit accord in there. 
here, it's not like smelling dried fruits. It's like smelling alive fruits, the mango, the red fruits, the um, coconut. It just pops. It pops off of this fragrance. It's beautiful. And nobody can work these type of notes into a perfume like Bertrand du Chiffre. He uses these notes that just seem like, how in the world are you going to make it all fit? And then it all fits. And like I said in, excuse me, one of my uh, previous videos, um, my uh, seal de gum review that it's almost like the um the rubik's cube is like one turn away and you turn it and it all just fits perfectly right and that's how this feels i can't believe they discontinued this i thought this would be a huge seller for the brand because of that tobacco vanille feel you know and people love sweet fragrances nowadays um and i am not a sweet fragrance fan but man or du sorel is impressive very impressive, very impressive work. Bertrand du Chiffre, man. When he was on the top of his game, very few perfumers could compete. Okay, number seven. Number seven, I have a full review of this on the channel. Um, one of the most underrated amouages and probably one of the most beautiful bottles of all time, in my opinion, with that gold. I mean, just dripping gold and royal red. Uh, this is Journeyman. I don't even have to spray this. I mean, I know this so well. Um, go check out my full review, but um, the spices in the opening, sort of the cardamom, the Sichuan pepper. This is a great example of a spicy, fiery Sichuan pepper with fresh neroli. And then you get that tobacco and frankincense, resins and cipriol. There's no oud, but there is cipriol and leather. And um, it's just, for me, this is like, you know, you command attention with this set. Like if you're giving a presentation or something and you want to have all eyes on you, this is kind of the scent to wear. It is so different. Obviously, they'll associate it with exotic Middle Eastern spicy, smoky type scents, but it um, it's clearly an amouage, but it is elegant and, and classy. It's not so far out there. Like, you wouldn't think of wearing Mitz Man to give a good presentation or something like that. People would think you're off, off your rocker. Um, and I love Mitz Man. I'm going to review it soon. I've been getting ready for a review or some of these crazier amouages that Christopher Chong has put out, which I love. Uh, things like Figment are also being weighted to be reviewed, Figment Man. But this kind of walks that line of both. But go check out my full review if you're interested in learning more. But um, tell you what, Journeyman is um, it, it is one of the most underrated amouages, according to me. Okay, that was number seven. Number six is a Parfums de Nicolai. And I mentioned Chanel's Pour Monsieur Eau de Parfum earlier. And I think this is even better for me right now. Uh, and I know the Chanel fanboys are like, <gasps> but I really, really love this fragrance. And I made the mistake of buying 30 mils of New York Intense and 30 mils of Geranium Intense. And God, I wish I just would have slapped myself and bought the 100 mil of New York Intense and just forgot about the bottle of Geranium Intense, stuck with my sample. Um, New York Intense is... Uh, it's just, I think it's amazing. It um, it takes a lot of the elements of Chanel's Pour Monsieur, but I think uh, Patricia de Nicolai, I mean, I think she, she was able to keep this modern lavender wood Bois de Portugal feel, you know, Chanel Pour Monsieur, Bois de Portugal, classy, elegant, and yet, she added things like civet and hyrax in the base. And there's some, there's something to be said about this very grown up barber shop fragrance. That is, you know, this is when you really want to feel like, um, when you want to feel like an adult. Okay. Sometimes you don't want to feel like an adult. Sometimes you want to feel like you're going out to the bar and you're going to have a good time. But when you want to feel like you have experience and when you want to feel, um, when you want to kind of stamp your authority on somebody else, this is the kind of scent that I would wear. It is so classy, so elegant. I mean, this is a fragrance that, to me, um, this is the type of fragrance that, to me, really, she reminds the world that, hey, I'm a Guerlain, because this smells like it has the elegance and the class and the old sort of you know, we are Guerlain's, only a Guerlain can make a Guerlain type feel. It feels like it's all in New York Intense. Like she just, I need to smell the original New York as well from the late 80s, but I love this stuff. And I really kick myself for not buying 100 mils of this. 
because I'm not the biggest Geranium Intense fan, I'll tell you that. It's grown on me. I don't hate it like I originally hated it. Um, well, I uh, originally disliked it, let's say. But uh, New York Intense is, um, that's a stunner. That'll get a full review very soon. Okay, and so that leaves top five. I had no clue where to put this. Honestly, this could have been number one. I'm not even shitting you right now. It, I just did not know where to rank this because it's so different from what I've been wearing and getting to know and stuff like that. And um, if you've been following my journey, you know that I'm very proud to say I like to go everywhere in the fragrance world. Cheapies, you know, expensive, high-end. Um, I like to look at niche. I like to look at designers. I like to look at vintage. I like to look at modern. I like to look at everything, right? But there was one part of the perfume world where I had not gone. And, and, and this gentleman opened my eyes to the beauty of wearing attar. And it is none other than Sultan Pasha. And he was on the channel. There's a live stream with Sultan Pasha. You can check out our conversation. That was a beautiful live stream. Like two hours of, of just joy. Like talking to a friend. Um, and so Sultan Pasha sent me some stuff, obviously. His, his attars are very expensive. Uh, but I was very blessed to get to know some of his work. And one of them came out in 2014. It's called, my God, I can smell it through here. Oh, fuck. I mean, this, um, to me, honestly, this could be number one. And, and when I ranked my 77 artisanal fragrances, I put this below um, one or two others that he's done. And then going back and looking, it's kind of like um, uh, the way that I felt about the Bortnikov. I put one above Lao Oud, and then I'm like, I, you know, I really think Lao Oud deserves to be above the other Bortnikov. So even when you do a list like this, sometimes your feelings change. I think this is my favorite, Sultan Pasha, to be honest with you. It is unbelievable. Came out in 2014. It's called Ensar Rose. And the reason it's so unbelievable is it has this white rose. They call it Rose Alba Otto. Rose Alba, like Jessica Alba. Rose Alba Otto. But there's Persian Rose Ottos. There is Bulgarian Rose Absolute, there's Honey, there's some Tuberose, and one of the most unbelievable Mysore Sandalwood Ambergris combinations in this very rare Oud from Ensar. Um, and it, it, this fragrance does something to my brain. Like when I smell this, it, it moves me in a way that very few modern perfumes have. So easily I could have just stuck this number one and said, screw you guys, this is number one. Like this, this is just where my head's at. And in fact, after wearing a tar, whenever, and Rich Mitch can verify this, but I wore some of his Sultan Pasha's work for like a week straight because I wanted to really get to know his work before he came on and to do the interview. And I remember after doing the interview and doing the final review of his attar, um, and it's not true. It's not the final because I have the whole sample set. I haven't gone through. There's like 30 fragrances, but it's like this much juice, like one drop. So I really have to be ready to do the review. Um, but after he came on, I told Rich Mitch in, in our WhatsApp, WhatsApp chat, I said, I don't want to go back to spraying fragrances. I just want to continue wearing Atar. He was like, what? I've never heard you talk like that. And I was like, man, I am hooked on these Sultan Pashas. He is the maestro. He is the Mozart of Atar. Uh, I have never smelled an Atar maker quite like Sultan Pasha. It is absolutely phenomenal. And I've got Atars from Insar and um, Kashti and stuff like that. They can't compete with this. This is absolutely on another planet. Absolutely on another planet. So I put it at number five. Just know that could easily be number one. Okay, number four. Number four is uh, an Eldo fragrance, and it's called Rien Intense Incense. I love Rien. Uh, I love the original Rien that um, um, Rien was originally done by uh, Antoine Lee. Now, there's no perfumer on Rien Intense Incense, but I would think it's a flanker that Antoine Lee was probably involved. Came out in 2014, of course. Smoky, spicy, and um, what's funny about Rien is Rien means nothing. So when someone asks you, hey, what are you wearing? It's supposed to be like nothing, but really it's like the biggest, heaviest, boldest fragrance out there. Lots of aldehydes, leather incense, cumin, all of these, you know, patchouli, heavy peppers and um, labdanum. It's such a huge, huge fragrance. If you like things like Gucci Guilty Absolute, excuse me, and stuff like that, check out Rien um, and Rien Intense Incense. Obviously, the incense is more amped up, but um, what a fragrance uh, that is from Eldo at number four. Number three, 
Number three is the one that I forgot to grab. It's Dior Homme Parfum. Some people don't like the Parfum. Some people prefer the Intense version. Some people prefer the original. I love all three. But the Parfum, to me, is amazing. I love the uh, Parfum of Dior Homme. It's the one I forgot to grab the bottle of. It's uh, leather, Florentine iris, and Salonese sandalwood. Some say there's an oud accord in there. There's definitely something heavy. Um, you know, it really... I remember AC from the channel Smells Good saying, when I want to lay it on thick, like when I'm going out and I really want to like peacock myself, like everyone look at me, that's what I wear, Dior Homme Parfum. And it makes perfect sense. It is beautiful. Uh, I love Dior Homme Parfum. Uh, I think it's amazing. I think it's one of Demashi's best works. So there's that at number three. Number two. Number two is also one of Demashi's best works, go figure. And it's called Queer Canage. This fragrance has grown on me like you could not even imagine. At first I was like, okay, you know, it's this modern version of Caron's Tabac Blonde. Uh, I like Roja's Great Britain better. And I still think technically Roja's Great Britain is better, but there's something about this uh, that has just grown on me. The more I've worn it, I love Queer Canage. Uh, it's like this, it's like this purple smelling uh, sort of cosmetic like um, leather, okay? So it's like a cosmetic leather, but it's not necessarily just lipstick. It's like you're getting the lipstick and the powders and all of these other cosmetic-like smells mixed with this very fresh orange blossom jasmine rose combination. So it's a leathery floral, but it's not feminine because that purple smelling iris just makes it feel so posh and elegant. And um, this came out in 2014. Great Britain came out in 2015 by Roja, one year after. So obviously I think this was a big inspiration. Uh, for Great Britain, and I um, I think this is one of the best purvés, period. I mean, this leather oud, um, you know, um, soaps, just a couple of the um, reviews that are going to be coming up on these purvés are just amazing. I can't wait to discuss them on the channel, but this one in particular, this one, man, I love wearing this too. It is, it's, it's, it really works with like my personality and and um this could easily be a signature scent and i've got enough to just douse myself in it but uh queer canage is i started with a 10 mil decant ran through the whole thing it's basically gone so um don't let that little bit of juice use fool you i have used a lot of this um and finally finally number one number one might shock some people because if you know me you know i love hardcore, animalic, challenging fragrances. And this is a Jean-Claude Elena, number one. He was number one uh, last year as well, when we did 2013. Um, and so he's number one again. The guy is not relinquishing the throne. Jean-Claude Elena with Hermes. This is Queer d'Ange. And Queer d'Ange is uh, the best Hermes since I've ever, I've smelled, in, in my opinion. It's not the best Hermes because that goes to uh, Bellamy the vintage, but Queer d'Ange is basically, Queer d'Ange means angel leather, okay? And uh, Jean-Claude Elena, um, you know, he makes these fragrances that are, I mean, you know what? It is also this cosmetic leather feeling. These two actually share a lot in common, and maybe that's why I'm digging them both so much, but there's this Hawthorne note that Jean-Claude Elena used in here. And Hawthorne always gives me this, it's a, it's a white floral, but it always gives me this um, obviously white feel. But I feel like Jean-Claude Elena learned how to use it to create this almost white bag, you know, um, or imagine like a pale beige. Like imagine this color of the juice, right? This pale beige or pristine white handbag with powdery eye eyeliner and um you know the blush and just all of these makeups thrown in there and um something a little smoky underneath the leather it's it's almost like you're getting a little bit of this growling purr of a of a smoke note underneath but he does it in his traditional watercolor aspect and what's so crazy about 2014 and just this being the number one spot in general for me is if you know me and you know my taste, this is one of the reasons I like to go everywhere in perfume because many people who know me would be like, man, there's no way he's going to like Jean-Claude Elena's work. Um, 
And some of what he did, things like Bellamy, Vetiver, the flanker, and this are just mind-blowing to me. I have been completely blown away. And you know what's funny is if you go back early on in, in when I entered the FragCom arena, if you will, I remember listening and I've joined some of the streams with Eugene where he would be talking about Jean-Claude Elena and he would say something and I'd be like, God, I, I hate that fragrance, you know? Um, I just hate his light watercolor style. It's like, uh, you know, just putting water in a bottle and selling it. I hated that, right? And and I never understood it. And, I, and, you know, a lot of times I kept my mouth shut, but I like the heavier, more bold stuff. And then as my nose kind of progressed, I learned to appreciate more and more of what Jean-Claude Elena has done. I think a lot of people who join the fragrance community go through exactly what I went through. You know, they don't want to smell what Jean-Claude, they want to smell stuff like Sultan Vetiver that lasts 12 hours and, and stuff like that, right? They don't want, they want to smell the Orto Parisis and these heavier, challenging, you know, the papyrus fragrances. And there's a place for all of that, the challenging animalic musks. But there is also a place for, to just appreciate the beauty of a composition. Queer de Orange is beautiful. It really is like looking at an angel. It's angel leather. Um, that leathery powdery combo is to die for. Yes, it's floral. Um, but God, there is, there's just something about it that when I smell it lately, I'm blown away. I'm like, my God, I mean, how is this so overlooked, you know? And there's many more Hermes, Hermes sauces I would like to smell. I haven't smelled the new Violet Volinka or whatever it is. There's a lot. There's so many fragrances. That's the thing about this hobby. It's impossible, impossible to keep, quote unquote, keep up, if you will. Unless you just do it every day. You do your due diligence and smell things every single day. You can't keep up. You have to find stuff you love and kind of stick with it. So I hope this video has been informative. This was a hell of a video and these are getting harder and harder and harder for me to do. So I hope you appreciate the time and effort and everything of taking everything out, putting everything away on and on and on. But um, thanks for watching as always. Share with me what your favorites are from the year. Uh, I appreciate everyone who watches and comments and likes and all the stuff, subscribes. It helps the, it helps the channel and I do want to grow, but I'm happy with my subscriber growth. I'm not someone that's going to go out there and buy subs or anything like that. You know, I um, I want everything to be done organically uh, and in due time, you know, because as people find you, you know, it's it's um, I want the growth of the channel to be organic and I'm happy with the way that it's going. But, um, you know, there's a lot of frag heads out there that I think would appreciate this type of content. And the more likes, the more watches, the more sort of subscribers obviously the youtube algorithm picks up on that and will recommend it to more people who are part of the old ram fam they just don't know it so as always cheers guys i love you thanks for watching and i'll catch you next time Bye bye